Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. We take from the thousands of business books out there and test the author's ideas by comparing them to real-world challenges. With over 40 years of projects between us, we've got quite a bit to compare against. We give you the condensed takeaways, followed by our interview with the authors. We know you want actions, not theories, and it's actions that we want to help shape, because that's what the Wicked Podcast is all about, helping you to become a wicked company. So, Marcus, tell me again exactly which big red button did you just press? <laughs> recording button. <laughs> right, okay. It wasn't the I alcohol don't have button. That. It was I don't the have an alcohol button. button. I wish I would have one. I think, you know, after COVID-19, I think, you know, let's do a Kickstarter and create an alcohol Well, you know, button. one of the most famous podcast uh, personalities on round, Tim Ferriss, often does kind of drunk dial sort of podcasts. So I don't think we should start that yet, but it's something we should there's consider. Kind of thing. There's like drunken history and something like that. And I'm sure there's there's also, there's a pa- Pavlovian thing about, you know, pressing the button way too much till it stops working. Yes. So the drugs don't yes. work no more. Okay. All right. It? Come on. We're, I'm, I'm going to reel this back. I'm going to reel this back. we got a really great guest on with a really great book that I enjoyed reading. Who is on the show today? Yeah, so we got Grant Cooper uh, over with us, and straight out of Silicon Valley. So he's a he's a Silicon Valley veteran, and uh, he wrote a book called Entrepreneur's Guide to Customer Development. Because he got a bit frustrated or had his observations about startups being able to really connect to the customer, to really test things and uh, test ideas and get them into a check with reality. And it's a really great book. It's got a, I think it's got an in, intro by. Um, Mr. Reese and these kind of things. So yeah, great conversation about startups, how to get an idea into customers, pivot, and so on and so on. But uh, what were your takeaways? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I really like that he kind of opens the book by by saying, look, this is the kind of book that as an entrepreneur, I'm going to wind up telling you things you don't want to hear. And I think it really is an antidote or an inoculation for what we talk about in startup world as survivor bias. Like people always said, what's ever going to happen with 140 characters of text? Well, that turned out to be Twitter. And some people say, well, they survived and became a multi-billion dollar company. So my idea will too. And they never look at the hundreds of thousands of ideas that were just as inane and just as stupid as Twitter, but they're they're committed to them. Um, so he's got one thing that he he mentioned that I really, really loved. And that is that pivot. And we talk about startups pivoting to do something different. But he says you pivot around one of three things. You take your learnings and your insights and you pivot around customer, around problem or around solution. And you don't try to pivot around something outside of those three. And that's really, really great and insightful. And it's part of the discussion that I I enjoyed the most. The other one was discussion about ecosystems and, and understanding the value of startups, figuring out where does my product or service fit within the ecosystem and what kind of value and insights can I have to my customers, to my suppliers, to my distribution partners, to regulators, but understanding that you're not just an island doing one thing and selling something to a customer, you're part of a larger ecosystem. And I could probably come up with about four or five more because not only did I enjoy the conversation, I I, I love the book, but for now I'll I'll, I'll shut up and I'll ask, what what did you take away? Well, I think for me, it's always nice to, you know, be able to dig a little bit into the heartland of the hype, which is the West Coast, Silicon Valley, and talk to someone who's been around there a bit and who knows a couple of people and it's been close to the real action that we often hear in the news and then have to figure out what what's right about and what's wrong about it, what's hype and what's 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 you know, what's just what's what's the myth and what's the actual story. So I think I enjoyed it mainly for that. And it's interesting that someone who's over there still writes a book that is so essential and so basic, but in a good way, right? I'm not saying it's basic in a bad way. I say it's like, as you said, everyone should have a book like that. Everyone should have should have these as a one-on-one when you do a startup, but a lot don't because the focus is either too much on tech or too much on features or too much on like, oh, because I think it's a great idea, therefore it must work, right? So and I think just, it's great just so you know, I, I loved the book so much. There was one particular startup that I've been advising 
I literally went on Amazon and I sent them a, a link to this book <laughs> and said, read book before calling me again. Yeah. Oh my God. You're selling yourself too cheaply, I guess. But no, no, but that's the thing. Like, you know, and in theory, that's the thing we shouldn't be doing or people shouldn't go into the, into these things with not having the basics. Not so the book's great for that. I mean, and it's only 120 pages, which is amazing. Like it's like really concise. There's a lot in it. It's, it's, it's may smaller than most. But, it but it's it's accessible. Change the value. It's, it, it's yeah. not short because there's nothing in it. it, it but it's really accessible. No, exactly. Like it, because it's normally. And I remember writing my book, and I go, "Oh, I only got 180 pages. I need to put more in, so it looks like a real book." It's like, no, it doesn't matter. It really matters what you put in there. The value that's in there, and you know. Also, when you look at Amazon, it doesn't you don't see how thick these books are. So you know, I know it's, it was really great, really concise. I liked it. I like to hear it from someone who's been down Silicon Valley and seen things and going like, hey, if you don't get it straight, I need to write it for you, you know? So it was a great thing. And yeah, as I said, we talk about pivots, talk about survival bias, talk about lots of things and the fact that a lot of entrepreneurs don't want to listen to it. I think that goes also for a lot of organizations for me. A lot of organizations don't want to hear that they're wrong because we've been in this for 10, 20 years and we tried this back then. It's like, well, no, got to try it again, got to check it again because reality has changed or this is reality how close do you rally really are are you still working with data from the 2000s because that has changed uh, and i think it's a really good reminder for that to check back with reality which is definitely one of our themes so it was lovely and the, the the cps customer problem solution hypothesis framework as you just pointed out works for mature companies that have either existing or new products every bit as much as it would for for startups but in any case, we also got a preview, an insight into his next book, Disruption for All. And before I tell you anything about that book or use the name Milton Friedman for our fifth episode, why don't we go straight to the interview? Yeah, let's do that. So hello, everyone. Today, we're talking to Brand Cooper. Hello, Brand, and thanks for making time. Thanks for having me. Lovely. So uh, let's start with like, please tell us, uh, our listeners, a little bit about uh, who you are and why you wrote the book we're talking about today. Yeah, sure. So I come from a startup background, so lived through the dot com boom and bust uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, lived through, uh, you know, some successes, IPO, acquisition, um, rapid growth that then tails off and doesn't recover and also, you know, massive failure. So uh, after the bust, there were a number of people that were trying to figure out maybe we could codify startups a little bit and, and figure out the ones that are successful, what do they do differently? And maybe we shouldn't make them look like big businesses right away. And I was part of that movement in the 2000s and ended up writing this book, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Customer Development. Uh, really following the practices of people that were already doing cool stuff, including uh, Steve Blank and uh, Sean Ellis and Eric Reese and uh, these other startup people that were talking and writing about, hey, we can we can build startups uh, differently. Hey, startups are changing, um, and so that's what led me to write the write the book. The the really the first book to talk about lean startup and product market fit and customer development and and those fun things. Yeah, and it's uh, um, you, you talk very really early on in the book about how this process, you know, uh, will, you know, tell entrepreneurs things they don't want to hear. Uh, you want to? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, nobody likes to be told their baby's ugly, uh, and and so the whole idea of the startup is you're really putting your idea on the line. Uh, you know, there's this whole myth around. Uh, the eureka moment and you know you have to have this great idea that just comes to you and then you you're obligated to go build it and and we all get latched onto our idea as if it's a great idea even if the idea is really not very good and so the whole premise of all of this stuff is wait a second let's go and see if we can test whether i our idea is uh, good or not. And it's really hard. It's really hard to really put it on the line to document your assumptions and then test your assumptions. And then really quite possibly, if not even likely to figure out there's your idea doesn't have, you know, any chance. 
Yeah, and yeah, also just through the testing, but with an objective bias, without too much bias kind of in favor of finding the results that you want. Right. That's the trick. I mean, so you actually have to be, you know, disciplined enough to run an experiment where you'll 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 believe and react to the results even if they're negative. Yeah. Do you ever like um because I some of that stuff reminds me of, you know, the dot com boom sort of the first iteration of that kind of stuff before startups were sort of a thing and things were a little bit different. Uh when the internet really started to become a little bit what it is now, you know, and I think back in the days, I was back in Hamburg around, you know, 97 until 2000. And uh, it sort of felt like similar to that where, you know, all you needed was a website and that, that all that mattered. And I remember back in the days, whoever can remember that, you know, you had things like flash intros, whatever the tech was delivering, you had these kind of new animations in front of a of a website. And it was sort of going the same way, you know, where suddenly everyone for thousands of pounds or dollars or whatnot was building these things and no one had ever asked if a customer actually wanted to have that in front of the website and what happened then was quite hilarious because they were built over weeks and weeks and designed and whatnot and lots of money spent and then within a week they were taken down because no one no one liked them no one wanted them and uh, those skip intro buttons appeared which then ended up naming whole conferences being named skip intro because it became this meme thing. <laughs> um, and that, that was just back in 2000. That wasn't even 2010. Right. So do, do you think, do you think there's been some learning in that or has it just become worse? Just kind of, you know, just have some crazy idea and just get tons of funding and it, it will work. Well, what's funny is that the, those one page websites are considered they're they're sort of gauche now, but they were, they're an experiment now because they're so inexpensive. They're free. As a matter of fact, you can set up that one page website now and it's free. So set up a one page website, put your value proposition up there, put a big buy now button, send it to your market audience, you know, through whatever means you want LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, or Google ads. And if you get this bunch of traffic and nobody clicks the buy button, maybe you've got a problem with your business idea. The difference is, is that back in the 90s and the 2000, early 2000s was even those simple web, websites cost tens of thousands of dollars to create. And so you were literally wasting tens of thousands of dollars. If people want to throw up one page websites now for free to test an idea, more power to them. I think that the other thing that has really changed is that back in the dot com day, you literally did raise money based upon an idea. And it was just so frothy. It was insane the way investors were were investing their money it's not that it's not that way anymore if you don't have hardcore ip then you don't get funded generally based upon an idea you actually have to go out and prove your business model to some extent and so i think it actually has improved i think that a lot of entrepreneurs sort of whine about that and they and they want to go raise money based upon an idea, but there's too many other people out there that are actually doing it, that are trying to get their business off the ground. And, and really that's what a real entrepreneur does is try to get an, uh, an idea off the ground, not just simply go raise money based upon it. Yeah. And the, and the big froth right now has gone to cryptocurrency. Yeah. And so yeah, that, the that's where all the crazy stuff is going on. Yeah. I mean, it's gambling. So, I mean, if you want to, if you want to gamble and you can make money off of that, more power to you. I mean, much of the stock market is that way as well. And I, again, if people choose to do that, I, you know, that's, that's fine. That's their money, but that's not really entrepreneurship. You know, in my view, the quote unquote real entrepreneurs are those that, that actually are passionate about creating some sort of value in the world. And they realize that wealth, is an outcome of that as opposed to the wealth being what's driving your goal in the beginning. And I think there's a fundamental difference there. And, and so again, my personal, my personal taste is I couldn't really care about the, the gamblers. Um, but the entrepreneurs that are actually trying to c contribute and try to create value in the world, those are the ones that I'm, I'm eager to help. Yeah, and, and the other one, so we've got the cryptocurrency people, which are alleged entrepreneurs or contrepreneurs, if you want to call them that, trying to raise money through crypto. Then you got the entrepreneurs doing it kind of legitimately, trying to do that. And you got the entrepreneurs 
they really have no idea what they're doing, but they're they're out there kind of you know you know fumbling around kind of in the dark, right? Pitching their ideas and wondering why nobody's writing them a check. And most of them are raising for exit, as you point, not raising to create value. Right. Yeah. Part of the problem is the investment community, and I think it really comes out of out of us the Silicon Valley uh, ethos. Uh, you know, I think consistently it's reported that the two number one reasons why startups fail is number one, there's no market for their idea, right? So that's sort of what the book is about. And then number two is premature scaling. And the premature scaling is rarely because the founders decided to scale. The premature mm. scaling typically comes from investors getting, trying to get them to scale at all costs because what those investors want to do is flip their shares to other investors and then they get to walk away with their returns. And so that's, that's broken. Uh, and I think that there are some dangers and some fraud around, uh, around, you know, crowdfunding and, and making funding available to, you know, more average retail investors. There's some issues there, but on the other hand, we need to figure out how to get just the, the large scale gamblers, the speculators, uh, out of, out of the startup investing too, I think. Yeah. And, and if you look, if you look at that, so one of, one of the aspects you're raising is as well as to, to, um, the way you use the word ecosystem as part of the process, you know, uh, which, or you can maybe, 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 um, you can you can explain it a bit as as kind of context, I guess, as well. You know where a product or service sits, how it fits into the ecosystem to actually better understand the value. Can you talk a bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that uh, you know the Alex Osterwalder's business model canvas gets into that a little bit, and Ashmora's lean canvas does, and so it's looking at the relationship that a startup has with multiple bodies inside of this broader ecosystem that that allows you to plan or at least to make assumptions about, to guess about what a successful startup looks like. It's a broader ecosystem and in the ecosystem can include not only obviously customers, um, but, uh, but investors, potential partners, other companies that need to provide products or services that in order for the customer to achieve their, the whole value that they're trying to achieve. It's easy to get narrowed down into, uh, this is my product, this is the specific problem my product solves, but in order for the customer to become passionate or for the customer to really feel like they've gotten everything out of what they wanted is by looking at what are the other factors that are involved in solving the bigger problem. Um, and so part of what I really try to focus on is getting entrepreneurs to understand their customers deeply so that they can understand not only the specific need, but going upstream and downstream to understand the full context of that need and to understand what is the impact on solving the bigger need for that customer? How does it make them feel? What's their aspiration? And the, the, this larger context is what I think provides insights and and to me insights are actually your competitive advantage more than you know the intellectual property or the quality of the features or whatever it's really am i really sort of nailing this deep value for this customer that makes that customer more loyal to you and makes you even put up with your warts and and some of these other things so yeah the the ecosystem, I think, needs to be looked at from a broader perspective just to visualize it. It doesn't mean that early on you're going to tackle all those components, but it's, it's, re it's really trying to, uh, to understand it at a different level. And if I can give one example, which goes all the way back to uh, the light bulb, actually, and I, I sort of joke about this. It kind of gets back to that, that eureka moment, you know, the very piece of bad clip art that that represents this myth of the visionary, the re eureka moment is the light bulb because supposedly Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Well, Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb. The light bulb already existed. What he did is sort of perfect the, the, the light bulb. So he ran, you know, his team was running experiments trying to figure out what the right filament was in order to make the, the light bulb viable in the marketplace. 
What Thomas Edison did that was genius, however, is that he created the market for the light bulb. So to me, the light bulb itself was actually the smallest part of that story. He, he figured out the distribution system for electricity, leveraging existing uh, gas lamp situa- um, ecosystem. And so he plugged the electricity into that system so that he could just go and replace gas lamps with light bulbs. I mean, so he did a number of those type of things. He had inventions that were outside in this broader ecosystem that literally created the market for electricity. Now that's worth, you know, the, the eureka moment. That's worth the, the light bulb is representing understanding this larger context uh, for, for a particular market. And it, it, it lines up well with, believe it or not, something I've been doing for the last 10 years, what I call my business ecosystem plan, which is very, very similar to what you're talking about. And it's creating the ecosystem of all the different stakeholders. So in, in the simplest ecosystem of you know, real estate, I've got a house, you've got some money. There are two players. There's a value exchange. That value exchange is house for money. But when you start pulling back and looking and you've got lawyers and you've got bankers and you've got surveyors and you've got real estate agents and you've got photographers, now you're seeing the broader ecosystem. That's and right. for each one of those, there is indeed a value exchange and it may be cash for house. It may be attention for social value, i.e. Facebook, which is then resold as attention for cash to an advertiser. But in my very first startup, way, way, way back, when I first got to the UK around 2004, 2005, I had not done the business ecosystem plan because what I was doing was I was trying to add value to consumers and I was trying to extract value from advertisers. And that was just never going to work because the advertisers didn't feel like they were getting anything. So they were never going to pay me. I was giving lots of stuff to consumers, but they were never going to pay me. And, and the business failed. But, but out of that understanding, the flow of value, the units of value exchange is really, really important. And to, to take to your insight where the real value is in creating markets and those kinds of things, Someone once quoted me that the best founders are in love with problems. They're not in love with solutions. And when you were pivoting around a problem, you're going to get where you need to go. But in order to pivot around a problem, you need insights. So I I mean, the the book was a real joy for me to read because it really resonated with so many things I've been talking about for so many years. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a great example. You know, the I think the healthcare industry is another really good example because right out of the gate, you have these various various stakeholders that have to be addressed right from the beginning. Patients, payers, uh, the healthcare providers, uh, maybe the administrators of the healthcare providers. I mean, it's just layers and layers deep and you can't concentrate on just one. In most startups, the number that you have to concentrate in on is relatively small. Um, but even in your example, you show that you can't ignore these others. There are others in there that are more powerful than you, perhaps, that will sabotage your business because it's not in their interest. And I think one of the ways I try to get people to think about this is that whenever you're introducing a new product or service, you're asking people to change behavior. Mm. And, it, it, you know, think for a moment how difficult it is to change your own behavior or change your kids' behavior. Try to get them to, you know, get up during the summer or before one o'clock in the afternoon. It's difficult to change people's behavior. And there's a plan that you need in order to change their behavior. They don't change their behavior for, you know, purely rational reasons because you're saving them a little bit of time or you're saving them a lot of time even. Um, and, and, there, and so you might have to, I don't know, an example might be a drip campaign where you're sending them an email every single day with a new reason why they should get up and do this different behavior. Uh, it takes a lot of work to change behavior. And in these ecosystems, you're actually trying to get multiple different entities to change their behavior. And and just understanding those things maybe paints this picture of how much work you have left to do uh, in order for your business to to get off the ground. And and to, 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 to finish that, from my side, also the ecosystem responds to the introduction of your product or service. 
So some people right. are going to love it. Some people are going to find you a competitor and try to kill you. So it's not just you're trying to change behavior of your own ecosystem and of your customers and of your supply chain. You're fighting the way the ecosystem is responding to some foreign body that suddenly landed in the middle of their business. I mean, look at what Uber has done to the to the taxi economy. That's right. That's right. Well, if I can chip in there, fellas, because um, <laughs> so I, might, I, might, I might slightly, I might slightly, no, 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 I know it's great. I might slightly disagree with that. Maybe it's just the wording, but maybe it's something else to um, let me, let me, let me, let me. Let me say something, then see if I can phrase that in terms of question, not just a statement. But so, um, with my sort of design thinking, service design background, um, and I think also referencing a little bit when we talked to Richard Chataway about uh, behavioral science, they they basically say, right, change your behavior, forget about it. You will never ever achieve that. You can't really create or change behavior. What you can do is you can nudge it, right? All you can ever do, and from a design background as well, sort of what we've been trying to do for you know decades now, if not longer. Um, design has a history of trying to design in a way so it becomes intuitive, or you're leading someone into intuitively using something. Right? Again, we're not changing necessarily behavior; we're trying to guide people to some extent, but not force it. And I think even then, there's probably just a particular window or scope within which you can really do something like that because um as we talked i think about um when we recorded yesterday's podcast um or generally you know working in change and transformation you can't really change people you can get them excited enough to maybe adopt and nudge and add something that you are talking about to their existing thing but they will do it still in their own way that they're used to right so they'll never fully leave their own behavior and i think that goes back to um if you look at phenomena like gym memberships that are just really really it's really really hard to get people to get into such habits of you know joining the gym and then sticking to it like diets right and that's why we have these peaks of gym memberships going up in like January and by the middle of February, they sort of get all canceled again. Um, so therefore I would, I would, one thing I would argue is we, we can change behavior, but, but what I find interesting when I look at companies and companies who are successful, especially with services and user experiences are that you are able to communicate your product and service in a way because you know the customer enough so that you find the right anchors in what exists already and then say, hey, that thing that you like doing, we do it a little bit better. So we don't expect you to change it, but we give you an incentive that is either you know more convenient or faster or more passive so you don't have to worry about it or something like that, right? I mean... The, yeah, to be honest, I guess I think that that's... Think? I, think it's, I think it's semantics. I mean, I think that... For people that study behavior, like you've studied behavior and like academics study behavior is really using the word in a more precise way than than an amateur like me. Um, to me, if if you're doing something in a particular way today and tomorrow I'm asking you to use my product instead of your existing product, then I'm asking you to change your behavior. You're changing something and that change is change. So maybe it's not behavior, but it's still change and you're asking them to change and it's not an easy change in the same reason why it's hard to get somebody to go to the gym. So number one, I guess I don't believe that people don't change their behavior. We change people's behavior all the time. It's hard to make it stick. And so then you actually have to do these other things, part of that ecosystem, to be honest, in order to make that change behavior stick. And so if you leave people sort of out there where they've changed their behavior for a short period of time and then they quit the gym or they quit the diet or whatever, it's because there haven't been these other support mechanisms inside the ecosystem that has allowed them to get to this point where it's sticky. Um, I think that there's been you know studies that probably indicate how long you have to uh, work on something in order for it to, for it to, to sort of permanently change. But fundamentally, I think people do change their behavior. I think it's really hard. Uh, but I also think that you're locked into a particular vendor. You're doing something the way you're doing it now. I want you to do something differently. So whatever word we want to ascribe to 
getting you to do something differently than the way you bef you were before. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I think I think maybe um, so, so I agree with that. And I think for me, it's always interesting to bring words from different practices together. And I think it's great when we can say we talk about the same thing. This is the same thing. You know, it's not as different as we think it is, because I've often been in meetings of people with different backgrounds and you run into that and they just clash. And they just don't agree. Yeah, totally. So it's lovely yeah. that we agree on this. The other part is also that um, maybe one thing. Um, that I've seen a lot. And I, so I used to be a coder as well. So I got both design and coding on my back. And what you see there often, not just in startups that are mainly driven by technologists, but also companies who go and think for the, from, a, from a company perspective and go like, hey, that's a great feature. We can do this. Isn't that great? We can do that. Therefore, the customer must love it. It's like, yeah, but the customer's behavior doesn't exist or the customer doesn't have the same need and that kind of stuff. So maybe uh you know th 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 there seems to be still this kind of interesting thing to think about what comes first is it what the can technology can do or what a customer is able to accept in adjusting around uh his or her own behavior right that always seems to be kind of one of those things especially in the beginning like when technology was so new there were all these new features like that's great let's just do it. it that's so cool that must work like and then it didn't you know um well i think that the I life cycle really adoption yeah i think the life cycle adoption yeah. curve applies here right i mean i think that you do have people that for a particular context are early adopters and they're people that already sort of recognize that they want to do something differently and they're looking for reasons or why or ways of doing that and so you, you sort of want to tackle those people first to me as you progress uh, uh, across that curve it you require it requires more effort and more marketing dollars right so when you go to your early adopters or you know it's relatively low cost and the barriers are a little bit low um but maybe getting the technology or the feature exactly right you know it takes a lot of iterations when you get to the early majority, well, now you have to show them what the early adopters have accomplished and you have to convince them that this is actually going to, you know, be of benefit and that they're going to be a hero at work or that that's going to save them, you know, massive amounts of time. And so the, the change is, is way more laborious and you have to look to other parts uh, of the selling process or the marketing process or the ecosystem in order to get them to, to, to go for it. And, and then, you know, you go to the late majority and, and it's the same sort of thing. It takes even more effort to the point you get to the laggards. It's, it's purely they, you have to scare them into it, right? That's where you get into the marketing that, that preys on people's insecurities and fears, because that's the only way that you'll get them off of their old way of doing it. And uh, so I don't know, I, I think it's just, it takes more marketing dollars, more effort as you as you cross that uh, curve. Absolutely, which is why you have to start with the early adopters, right? But so so that's that's then interesting. So if you could elaborate then a little bit, um, because um, it is often that you start with an idea and while you work on something, I think most startup stories have something in there where they went, oh well, we started quite differently, and eventually we found this, and then we had to sort of pivot and change our thing. And that's that's the only reason why we end up with the business model we have now. Talk a little bit about pivots and failing and how failure is not failing, but learning and a value in order to be able to pivot and find what you can find in terms of resilience for an idea. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. So, I, you know, when we were defining that whole lean startup methodology, uh, you know, in, in the 2010 era, uh, you know, it boiled down to customer problem solution. And those are all hypotheses. We think we know who our narrow early adopter market segment is. And we describe them based upon, you know, a combination of characteristics and behaviors and this idea that they share the same problem. It's not about necessarily, it can include, but it's not it's not old school demographics. You know, we're not trying to sell between, you know, all males between 25 and, and 35. We're trying to sell to, you know, uh, uh, 25 to 35 year old hipsters who want to look really sharp and buy, you know, 
good looking clothes, but they hate to shop. And, and, uh, so they find it, you know, difficult to find clothes that wear whatever you go really super narrow, uh, and, and hoping you're finding your early adopters and that's your customer. And the problem is, is then what is the, what is the need that all of people in that group share? Um, community is a great way to think about that, right? A community comes together because they share the same need. It has less to do with what they look like um, and more to do with the fact that they're all trying to uh, address this passion or, or desire or problem or whatever, however you want to describe that. And so that's your problem statement. And then the solution is, is you know, what are the what are the things that you must do as a business in order to address that need sufficient that they'll pay you? Um, and so those are all assumptions that need to be tested. And originally the pivot was you're changing one of those three primary uh, factors, customer, problem, or solution, and you're keeping the other two the same so that you're not trying to change and manipulate too many variables at once. The pivot is literally, I'm keeping my foot grounded in this part of my business model but I'm moving the other foot around in order to try to figure out how they match. And so you can start off by going, well, I really want to serve this particular customer segment because I'm, I'm a member of it and I'm, and I love these people. Um, but they didn't really have the problem I thought they had and, and, or the priority of the problem wasn't high enough that they were going to do anything about it. And so I'll change the problem or perhaps I want to stick with the problem and that customer. And I want to try a different solution. So the idea, again, is you're sticking with what you've learned is correct, and then you're changing one of those three elements in order to figure out where there's a business. And it doesn't mean the first pivot was correct either. You can, you can go back to the original thing that you left and then change a different element. Um, yeah, so that's the fundal, fundamental idea of the, of the pivot is that you're you make assumptions about who the customer, the problem, the solution is, and now you're rigorously testing, rigorously learning whether those elements are correct, which elements are correct, and which ones do you have to change or fine tune in order to find this group of like-minded people who share the same problem that are ready to you know, pay you some sort of currency for you to address their need. Brent, <clears throat> Brent, yes, uh, we we completely lost you for the last ten seconds. Uh, so, I ended with, uh, you know, in summary, you start with an assumption around what the customer is, the problem, the solution, and you're iterating on and 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 changing each of those in order to find that combination where you find this group of people that share the same common need and are hoping to pay you money in order for you to address that need. Yeah. And, and I think if you asked a hundred uh, alleged entrepreneurs, could they define pivot in the way that you just did? I don't think anybody would. And yet I think that, I think that really that is, that's a real gem that a lot of entrepreneurs should, should take away that pivoting is indeed around the customer, around the problem or around the solution based on the knowledge and the information that you have and not just doing a wild swing kind of left, left or right. Um, we were interviewing uh, Rita and I've forgotten Rita's surname. So apologies for that. McGrath. Uh, McGrath, McGrath. Seeing, McGrath. seeing McGrath. around corners. And she used this word or expression, are they customers or are they hostages? And the example that I kind of put, <laughs> put forward were some cable television customers you know, they were indeed hostages. They were locked into a single play. Now they're locked into a triple play. So they're getting their TV channels, they're getting their mobile phone or their fixed line phone, and they're getting their internet connection, but they're getting hundreds and hundreds of channels that they're never going to watch for content that's not interesting or new to them. And they feel like they are indeed hostages. And somebody like Netflix comes along and offers them the solution to get them out of that hostage situation. And that is a community of hostages that if you do the right things, the entire community will will move. And I thought that was a, a really interesting kind of pulling your discussion and the, the discussion with Rita together. Yeah, I mean, Rita McGrath is super interesting. She was essentially writing 
about this sort of thing, I don't know, at least 10 years before Lean Startup got hit. Yeah, so we really enjoyed uh, interviewing her uh, as well. And that was, was that on Monday, Marcus? I think it was on Monday. Um, I could check the calendar. It was uh, either last one or the one before. So it was yeah. literally. We, we, yeah, we, we affectionately <laughs> referred to this as, as, as Hell Week because we've got four recordings that we're doing almost every day this week, plus a fifth one thrown in that's a, a special one off. So we've got a lot of business books, a lot of great authors, and a lot of podcast recording to do. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess That's a good problem to have. I, mean, I think what's interesting about the hostage one, not to get political, but uh, part of the problem, in my view, is that governments are allowing the hostage taking through allowing mergers and acquisitions and this corporate consolidation. Um, so it's great that Netflix can can come and, 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 you know, free up people a little bit there. But uh, a lot of people are still hostages. <laughs> yes. They, they, they absolutely are. And I think that the big corporations are continuing to do that. I mean, and of course, the big corporations are starting to fight back. You know, you get the HBO solution, you get the Disney Plus solution, and they're kind of ripping all of their content out of Netflix to, to try to be competitive and to create more hostages yeah. of people in their own camps and get them to pay not one, but two or three subscriptions. And it's a, it's an interesting thing. Um, can yep. we go back to the beginning of the conversation before we even press the big red record button and talk about your new book that's coming out uh, and to how Milton Friedman's hopefully his days are, are in sunset? Yeah, it's, thanks for that. I So the tentative title is Disruption for All. Uh, and the idea is that we are being disrupted. We will be dis continue to be disrupted. We're going through this massive transformation from the industrial age into the digital age. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's sort of a clarion call that we need to take the bull by the horns and make sure that disruption is benefiting us all. Um, and a lot of that has to do with how corporations are responding. And so for the last six years, I've been helping uh, you know, very large enterprises uh, try to think through how they're changing their business in order to adapt for the 21st century. And, and a lot of their innovation practices and now, you know, digital transformation is super hip. And a lot of those practices, I think, are just fundamentally done wrong. And, and, and I'm not sure they've gotten the big picture. And so I'm trying to outline in the book, uh, here are the changes that corps need to make. Here's a way to go through the change. There's a myriad number of ways. It's not just my way, but here's a way to get going. Um, and then it's uh, it's why we should be doing it. And it's for the benefit of uh, customers. It's for the benefit of employees. Ultimately, it's it's for the benefit of the planet, though the book itself is not a corporate responsibility book as much as it's a, let's a return to learning how to create value for human beings again. And a lot of these other problems um, sort of take care of themselves to a certain degree if we if we refocus on that. And so that last point really gets to to your intro, uh, you know, Milton Friedman back in 1970 uh, you know, wrote the, his screed, the Friedman doctrine on how uh, corporations should be focused only on shareholder value. Uh, and super interesting, New York Times wrote a, uh, you know, sort of a memorial paper on that uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there's all of these pundits and entrepreneurs and academics that are weighing in on it. And for the most part, they've all sort of at some level rejected it. And that in this day and age, corporations do have to look beyond uh, shareholder value in order to succeed. And so I'm super hopeful that we're moving into a time where, uh, you know, that's part of the conversation and that we, we can get corporations to be uh, solving problems, not just, you know, causing them. Uh, and so I hope the timing of the book is right to get corporations to help them uh, reestablish this value creation. Um, I think there's a role in, of government too. And, and I think it's just a, in, an interesting time for these conversations and, and, you know, the horrors of the pandemic also sort of, you know, really drive home uh, the need for fundamental change. Mm. So when I talk about redefining capitalism, I say that we need to move from strict shareholder maximization capitalism. capitalism uh, of course, Milton Friedman says within the rules 
which kind of implies government setting regulations to, to manage and maintain those rules. And then I break it down into five different stakeholder groups. You do get shareholders, but you get customers, you get employees, you get society at large, i.e. your payment and taxes. And then the last one is indeed the environment. And if we can rebalance capitalism to be respectful to all five shareholder groups, then I think we're going to be in a, in a great shape. One of the challenges I think we have right now is that the majority of people who own shares are indeed my parents' generation and, and beyond who are living off of all of their, their retirement savings, which are invested in shares. And they only care about dividends and increase in share value because that's the only income they've got. So I, I do think that we are indeed shifting as millennials and Gen Z and whatever they're calling the next generation move along, we're going to have a more balanced kind of feeling across capitalism, but I'm not really sure. And while I was saying all of this, I got kicked halfway across London because Marcus wanted to say something. So I'm going to turn the mic back over to Marcus. Well, thanks for the transparency there. Uh, yes, because <laughs> I had an initial follow-up and, you know, we have a little channel where we text back how we ask the next question, just to be appear smarter than we are. Um, so yeah, so I think generally this is general. This is a really great discussion. I think um, in term in terms of theme for book, this is amazing because um, you know we had a few bits and pieces, maybe to that puzzle as well. You know, we had like a uh, Graham Boyd there who talked to us about new kind of legal structures for organizations and those kind of things and. Um, and other 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 um, contributors who talked about a different kind of purpose that um, you can bring along, and I think uh, w w what you just said there, um, Brand as well, rings rings well with you know when I try to, from a service perspective, we we we, we tend to bang on a lot about a customer, and the least that there is is that there's an imbalance in current organizations between you know, the business benefit and the customer value and um, capabilities of what's actually doable. And you try to strike a balance, but I think the businesses, the current businesses tend to shoot themselves in the foot often by prioritizing business benefits and then realizing that they're losing customers. And I think beyond that, I think it's great that you actually took that all out um, and went for like, you know, this is not a business business, business purpose kind of book. Because I think we have to go step a bit further out and then maybe come back and let that redefine organizations. So um, I think for now, I would say, I know it's a working title, so uh, you better tell us when it's done because I'm sure we'd like to have you back. And as usual, you know, I'm looking at the time, too many questions, too little time. So um, I think at this point, uh, it's 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 great to hear, and it would be great to spend another hour on 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 that book and what it is. Yeah, well, you know, um, always got to leave the audience with more, right? So I appreciate the conversation, and I would love to come back and and uh, Troy, uh, the way you're thinking about it is is very uh, aligned. Um, I, you know, I, I have some sort of specific ideas there too, and it would be it would be a really super fun uh, conversation to have with both of you. We'd, we'd, love, we'd love to do that. Yeah, that's that's our first proper cliffhanger right then and there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I say thank you so much, Brent. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your insight. And thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, fun discussion, guys. All right. Have a great day. Okay, thanks. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-hosts Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com.